bought any Christ stuff, the man of steel. Uh, actually, we finished with God. I just wanted to remind myself and everyone else I don't have this on the list, Patty. I apologize. Uh, but the last uh, command to Daniel is to stand still and see God's deliverance. And I always like to end on a good note because that's what the gospel is. It's the bad news first and the good news to end. Uh, and he says uh, in Daniel 12, 13, But go thou thy way till the end thee, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Uh, so despite all these crazy visions and, and prophecies and dreams and the horrible calamities they portend, God says at the end of it, you and your people will be at peace. And so we proceed now to the Gospel of Matthew in which the Christ comes on the scene to offer Israel that peace. And we'll find that they don't accept it in the way that he's offering it, but uh, he, that offer then extends to you and me 2,000 years later. And all the people who have ever been born into this world ever since have had the Gospel offer of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ extended to them. So we want to begin in the, in the Gospel of Matthew... And uh, note a few things. It begins with the genealogy, and oftentimes, if you're like me, my eyes glaze over when I get to genealogies. They're not all that interesting. But in times past, people have pulled out of genealogies very interesting things. Uh, there was a very popular book written about, oh, man, like 20 years ago now, called The Prayer of Jabez. It was based on one of the uh, genealogies from the Old Testament. And it, uh, just in the middle of it, he... There's all these people begetting other people, and then Jabez prays a prayer of faith, and God blesses him for it. So there's all these cool things, if you want to call them Easter eggs, or uh, things that God includes in these to make sure that we're paying attention even to what many would consider the boring parts of Scripture. Turns out it's anything but boring. I want to begin by noting that as we go through this genealogy, it says in Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, we're going to have a lot of sons or begettings uh, in this, and they are going to skip several generations between. It was, not, uh, it was not a direct line between Obed and Jesse. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, between... Um, oh, hold on a second here. Between, uh, yeah, Obed and Jesse. There were, there were centuries between them uh, because... Because the Rahab and, and Boaz were in the time when Israel was just coming into the promised land and were engaging in battle around the city of Jericho. And then Obed to Jesse was right before King David. And there were centuries in between. Now, what we're noting in the fact that generations are skipped is explained in verse 17 of the genealogy. The Holy Spirit explains to us why people are omitted from the genealogy. It says in verse 17, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So God wanted to make sure that there were three 14s or six groups of seven uh, indicated through the genealogies, and what that means is the Israelites' ears would perk up and say, hold on a second. We're getting to the seventh, seven. We've had six uh, groups of seven in this genealogy, and now we're going to be introduced to the seventh, or the culmination, or the completion of all these promises. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing through Matthew. He's introducing us to the fulfillment of the anticipation of Israel's Messiah. And so... Uh, that, that's exactly why the people are skipped. It's not necessarily that some of them are more or less righteous than others. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's just to get the numbers right so that you understand the next person to be introduced is going to finish this list. Now, in, uh, so in, 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 as you go down through, it says uh, Abraham begat Isaac in verse 2, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas. Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar, and Pharaoh begat Esau. Uh, Ezra, Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram, and Aram begat so forth and so on. Compare that to the list in Genesis 5. Now the names are different, but that's not what I'm going for here. Genesis chapter 5, 
you have in verse 5, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. And Seth lived 105 years begat Enos and so forth, and all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. Uh, and then it says in verse 11, and the days of Enos were 905 years and he died. And then in verse 14 it reads, and he died. And then in verse 17 it reads, and he died. Then in verse 19 it reads, and he died. Then in verse 27, and he died. And in verse 31, and he died. Now note that Enoch did not die. He was simply taken. He walked with God. And his name, by the way, means to strive. And so this was not a casual stroll down the path with God. This was a man who was actively pursuing an intimate relationship with God. And as a result of that striving or that pursuit, God said, you have been so conformed to the man I'm creating you to be, you're ready to go now. And 365 years into his life, Enoch was translated into heaven that he should not see death. But the, the point being that all these people died throughout the, the verses in Genesis chapter 5. And in fact, in Scripture, the number 5 is the number of death. It also relates to grace because God's grace is extended to us through the death of his son Jesus Christ. But the difference between that and the Matthew 1 list is that we're not told that these people died. They begat and they begat and they begat and they begat on down through successive generations. We're never told that they died. And that takes us to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so as we go down through the messianic line, we see that these people are quickened or made alive in Christ. Yes, their bodies died and were buried and laid in caves and laid in tombs and, and, and covered under the, under the dust, but they're still alive. In fact, Jesus made a very special point in the Gospel of John to tell people that when Moses encountered God in the burning bush, that he told Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not I was or I used to be, indicating that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So I'm thankful, yes, as, as Adam begat Seth, and Seth begat, the, and it went all down through those generations, and they died, and they died, and they died. When Christ shows up, all of a sudden everyone's alive. Thankful that we have salvation from death. Now, not necessarily physical death. Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have fallen asleep, even just in the last several years here at church. And yet in Christ, they are alive. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Thankful that Christ, the last Adam, undid the chain of death that began with Adam. Now, you also know some very suspicious characters throughout this list. We have Rahab. She was a harlot. She uh, ran, ran a brothel there in, in Jericho when the Israelites showed up. Then we have... Tamar, in verse 3, she played a harlot in order to get her father-in-law, Judah, to bear her sons because her husband had died without bearing her a son. And then we have Ruth, who is uh, a Moabitess. And then we have, um, oh, Rahab is also a Canaanite. So we have a Canaanite and a Moabitess. We have, uh, in verse 6, David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the, the wife of Urias. And so in verse 6 we have Bathsheba, who probably is a Hittite. We're not told for sure, but her husband certainly is a Hittite. And on down through the list are very, the people that the, the nation of Israel would be very questionable as to why are they included in this lineage of the Messiah. Which just goes to show that God is just looking for someone who's willing he doesn't care about your past if you're willing to let him have your future. Was Mary sinless when Gabriel came to her and made the announcement? No. But she said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be uh, to me according to your word. 
In other words, I'm willing. I'm willing to be a vessel who carries Christ into the world. And so uh, I'm thankful for the, the message of redemption contained. Look at uh, David for crying out loud. We know everything he did wrong. It's recorded for us uh, in, in uh, 1 Kings and, and 1 Samuel. And, and Solomon for, you know, a thousand wives. My goodness, who would want a thousand mothers-in-law? Uh, this is just unbelievable when you go down through and actually pick apart every person listed in the chronology and the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm cheating a little bit because this isn't the true genealogy of Jesus Christ, and we'll get to that in a minute, but the Scripture highlights people who are very flawed, which means that there's still hope for me and hope for you if we are willing to serve, willing to let it be a, uh, unto us according to the Word of God. And they help bring the Savior into the world. Now, as I said before, you and I are sinners, unworthy, unqualified, unclean, and yet God invites each one of us to bear his son into someone else's world, to share the gospel with someone. When it says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And it says in John chapter 1 that as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his names, which were born not of water, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the Spirit. Just as the Holy Spirit conceived this baby in Mary's womb to bring forth the Savior of all mankind, so the Holy Spirit today in every willing heart conceives the Savior as that man or woman is born again through faith in Jesus Christ. And you and I, just like Mary, become, yes, flawed, yes, why him, why her, yes, unclean, become vessels of carrying the most holy Son of God into the world. I'm thankful for that invitation. I hope we take that uh, with great joy and enthusiasm, but also with great gravity. As the, uh, the old poem says, that sometimes the only gospel someone will read is you. So suspicious characters allowed to bring the Savior to the world, just like those of us here gathered in this sanctuary. It's very suspicious characters, if you pick our lives apart, invited to bring the Savior into the world. Now, uh, I want to note here uh, in, uh, which verse? It's towards the end of this list. It's, uh, where's, oh, Jeconias in verse 12. It says, after they were brought to Babylon, Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. Now, now, here's another thing. The, to, to the antiquities of the Israelites, these names were lost. They were carried into captivity. They came back out of captivity. They came back to Jerusalem. They were under siege and sacked. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, slaughtered the pig in the sanctuary and, and erected an idol in the most holy place. They were scattered and fled. Then they came back together. Herod kind of repaired the temple. Now they had temple worship again. And all these records of who begat who were lost. And yet God knows exactly who they are. And likewise today, the Israelites in 70 AD, uh, when Jerusalem was sacked and the temple finished off for good until today, the Israelites have been scattered throughout the world, and they've been in, under persecution, and they've had to flee for their lives, and they've been despised and hated in the countries in which they dwelt, and yet at the, uh, in Revelation, 144,000 witnesses are sealed, 12,000 from every tribe, and God knows exactly who they are. The Israelites don't even know, all of them, who they are, but God knows I'm thankful God's keeping an eye on things. That means he never loses track of you or me. Now, uh, then Jeconiah, that's a problem. That is a problem because there was a curse pronounced on Jeconiah and his line in the book of Jeremiah. And we will turn to Jeremiah 22 to find that. 
or flip to it on the screen. Jeremiah 22 and beginning in verse 24 says, As I live, saith the Lord, though Paniah, that's Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee hence. So he said, If you were a ring on my finger, I would rip you off. And I will give unto thee the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even unto the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out, my mother that bare thee, into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land whereunto they desire to return, thither shall they not return. So he says, you're going to be gone, and you're going to wish you could come home, but I'll never let you come home. Is this man, Kaniah, that they despise broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. This is God three times, not just talking to Israel, but talking to everyone throughout history. Thus saith the Lord, write to this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David, and ruling any more in Judah. So we have a very serious problem if Jesus is descended from Jeconiah. He can't be the Messiah sitting on David's throne with that curse over the line of Jeconiah. And God gives us the solution to this problem in two places. First is in, uh, in, in, in chapter 1, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David, 14, 14, 14, uh, and from carrying around to Christ are, are 14 generations. And then he says um, that Joseph... I missed the verse. Where is the verse? Oh, verse 16. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So God, within the text, solves the problem. Joseph is not Jesus' father. I said, God said that Joseph is not Jesus' father. And he says further in verse 18 that she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So God says... Yes, because Joseph is descended from the kingly line of Judah, even those that were carried away into captivity, and I kept track of them, and even though he has legal right to the throne because he's the son of kings, the line from which his father came was cursed, so I can't let that man be his father where the curse will fall on Christ. So what do I do instead? God does what he listed in Luke chapter 3. Chapter 3 is the genealogy of Jesus' mother, Mary. The only human blood that flowed through Jesus' veins with it was that of his mother. It had nothing to do with Joseph. And it says uh, in, in uh, chapter 3 and verse, we're going in reverse here. Instead of going from Abraham down, we're going from Jesus backwards. And in verse 31 it says, which was the son of Malia, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Metapha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. And so in Matthew you have a genealogy which goes through David to Solomon and on down through all the kings of Judah and even into captivity and back. And here in Luke you have a genealogy which still goes through David and you still get all those rough suspicious characters like Rahab and Tamar and Ruth. And, and David himself, but instead of going to Solomon after David, it goes to his son Nathan, and the, the opportunity for Messiah to come through this line is still preserved because there's no curse on this line. So Jesus came from the only line of David that was qualified to put a king on Israel's throne. Born to Mary is stepfather, if you will, was Joseph, and so he had the godly right to the throne of David, and he had the legal right through his stepfather Joseph to the throne of Israel. Only God can keep track of all that and put it all together at the right place in the right time. Now, I want to conclude with something that Liz actually brought up uh, during the worship set this morning, and she said, Sometimes I feel like the messages are for me. And I'll tell you, I have never thought of Liz when
when I was getting a message ready. <laughs> but she takes it personally. She takes it to heart. It affects and changes her. And I hope it changes me as I'm getting the message ready through the week. And I hope it changes each person here as you hear it. You know, I sometimes will hear from someone, I'm, I, I, I liked your message today, but I wish so-and-so was here because they need to hear it. And I'm sometimes thinking to myself, actually, you need to hear it more. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> but thinking about someone else, when I'm confronted with God's Word, it's like, you ever been to the colleges and they have their tennis complex there, like 12 courts in a line? And it's like you're standing on a court and someone's feeding balls into the machine and hitting them towards you, and you're looking in the court over and saying, hey, why isn't that guy hitting the ball back? It's in your court. You take care of it. And so when we open scripture, we shouldn't be thinking about who else needs to hear it. We should say, God, why do I need to hear this? What do I need to do with this? How does this need to change and affect me? And so note that David named the third son from his wife Bathsheba, whom he stole from Uriah and had him murdered. He named his third son from Bathsheba, Nathan, after who? After the prophet who confronted him with his sin. Is there anyone who's come into your life and told you about yourself. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And you've later been so thankful that you wanted to be called by their name? How about Jesus? You know, so many times I'll be on my knees confessing the fault or assume the God. And he's never spoken to me verbally, and I can't tell you that these are God's words. But I was confessing something to God just this week. And I instantly knew that he knew. And that he was going to work on it. And that he still loves me. And I am thrilled to be called the name Christian. Thrilled to be called by the name of Christ. Someone who confronts me head on with what's wrong with me. And here's David. He said that the man in Nathan's story, the man that stole his neighbor's lamb and... and only lamb and slaughtered him when, when the man himself had thousands he said that man was worthy of death and Nathan points right to David and said yeah buddy that's you and three or three sons later with Bathsheba he's naming his son after the prophet who told him about his sin so I'm so thankful that yes Jesus is pretty rough he said the Holy Spirit was going to come into the world to convince us of sin of righteousness and of judgment two of those three things are awful Sin and judgment are horrible, but righteousness, not our own, but through faith in Him. And so in the meantime, as you and I are in the process of being remade, as we're in the process of having the rough edges sanded off, as we're in the process of having the, the uh, knobs and spurs ground off, and as we're in the process of going into the refiner's fire and, and being melted down and reshaped and on the potter's wheel and retooled, and we're, have, we're going through that process, and yet we have the, the, the certain knowledge that in the future I will bear the righteousness of Christ, <laughs> which means that that future righteousness, I'm not going to get to heaven, and I'm going to be so such a beautiful finished product that God will say finally you're worthy to enter into heaven. I will look like Christ but it was never about my righteousness in the first place. It was always about Christ's righteousness which means a righteousness that will apply to me as I walk through the glorious gates of heaven and enter into the blissful presence of God forever applies to you and me right now. Right now. So let him tell us about ourselves. Because it's never been about our righteousness to earn God's favor, or His grace, or His mercy, or merit His love. It's always only ever been about Christ's righteousness. And so you and I can be thankful, indeed just a little proud, to be called by the name of the man who confronts us with our sin. I invite the musicians forward to close us in worship. If you would like any kind of special prayer... I'll be off to the side or else you can come down front and just do business with God yourself.